Good evening to everyone. My name is Rafael Capo. While I do study, uh, I'm doing my PhD at the University of British Columbia. I am, uh, I live and I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where I currently am. I'm the creator of the Decolonial Memory Project, which you can see on your screen. It's a digital humanities initiative dedicated to mapping and contextualizing uh, colonial monuments in Puerto Rico. Um, thanks again to the Digital Humanities Symposium for organizing this event, welcoming me here to talk about not just about monuments but and digital humanities, but also about memory, identity, and how we remember the past, which is the topic really of, of, of my project. Um, during this representation, I will first introduce the project briefly along with its theoretical framework with the goal of expanding the margins of what we consider to be colonial. Next, in hopes of converting the space into a community of inquiry, perhaps, I will share some methodological quandaries I have faced while developing the project, obstacles in digital mapping that pushed uh, me towards intellectually stimulating conundrums and that have forced me to consider the importance of intersectional analysis um, in, in digital mapping. Reason why I highlighted the previous presenters uh, overlapping right, uh, spaces. So I haven't always been fascinated by monuments. Like most people, I took them for granted and barely even noticed them for most of my life. Uh, but with the Black Lives Matter movement, that, that it somewhat changed that for me. Um, monuments stopped being just sculptures as I started reading the discourses of their visual narratives. I began to see maneuvers of power and control much more clearly. With this newfound interest, I decided to explore my country, Puerto Rico, to better understand this form of, of what I consider to be the public curriculum. The main question I asked myself was, how does colonialism frame, if at all, the commemorative landscape of the formerly and presently colonized peoples of Puerto Rico? How does memory change as it passes through history. For Pierre Nora, places of memory frame the past as, and I quote, voluntary and deliberate, experienced as a duty, no longer spontaneous, end quote. Monuments offer valuable insights into how the state and certain sectors of our civil society want us to remember the past and want us to consider ourselves to be. As Andreas Korber would argue, they do not teach or say anything new they remind us of something we supposedly knew all along and simply needed a gentle yet monumental reminder. An analysis of colonial monuments in Puerto Rico understood in the traditional sense of the word colonial as a foreign occupation would have yielded interesting yet extremely limited, limited results. I could have prefaced this project with the words colonial memory project or anti-imperial memory project or even decolonized uh, or decolonizing memory project. But none of those concepts uh, truly capture the epistemological framework I needed to deploy in order to capture the ways colonialism and coloniality have shaped our past and present. If we limit ourselves to an anti-imperial perspective, then the Spanish empire and issues of race can sneak into our collective patrimony with ease. I am not interested, as necessary as it might be, in simply challenging the absurdity of commemorating the US regime in Puerto Rico that continues to oppress the Puerto Rican people. Rather, I am committed to pushing back against racism at its Eurocentric root. We must absolutely question statues, holidays, and school names dedicated to US presidents in Puerto Rico. But we, we must look at them in the context of the modern global colonial system for which Spain and Portugal, going back to the previous uh, presentation, played a fundamental role. For this reason, coloniality and decoloniality underpin the ways I think about colonialism and its long lasting legacies. Um, the, the coloniality of power, as first formulated by Aníbal Quijano, posits that modernity, capitalism, racism, and the discovery of the Americas are inseparable. The decolonial turn is the collective effort of a group of scholars who have focused their research on the critique of coloniality and not just colonialism, along with the myth of modernity. For these authors, colonialism is not just a political endeavor, rather it is 
an epistemological force. Decolonial scholars argue that the ideas of modernity, of enlightened rational thought and capitalist progress were born from the conquest of the Americas. Modernity is conceived from the ego conquiro, I conquer, and not the ego cogito, I think. And as Nelson Maldonado Torres, who's also Puerto Rican argues, I quote, just like the ego conquiro predates and precedes the ego cogito, a certain skepticism regarding the humanity of the enslaved and colonized sub-others stands at the background of the Cartesian certainties and his methodic doubt, basically uh, negating the humanity and the, and the legitimacy of, of creating knowledge of, of enslaved peoples and indigenous uh, peoples. So um, the process of mapping and visualizing the coloniality of the commemorative landscape inevitably led me to develop certain categories. So when you go to the website, which is called uh, decolonialmemory.com uh, or Memoria Decolonial, um, you'll find a map, right? Here's the map. And the legend of the map or the key you can see here uh, shows how I divided uh, uh, the data that I, that I explored. And when I explored coloniality, uh, colonial monuments, it's not just Spanish and US, right? It's the hierarchies that are created through colonialism, race, citizenship, gender, class. So uh, these categories, uh, the four dominant themes that surfaced were Spanish heritage, US imperialism, race and mestizaje, and war. The issues I face with these categories and the main topic of this paper presentation is that while they capture broad themes, their selection obfuscates other equally interesting and problematic patterns. An intersectional approach adds much needed nuance to my analysis, yet it also complicates its digital mapping. While the intersection of identities and different forms of art makes it difficult to comprehensively map the colonial landscape, it nonetheless opens up debate around significant issues that otherwise might go unnoticed if digital humanities were so simple. The limitations and conundrums I face push me into uncomfortable yet vigorously intellectual places that opened up complex issues surrounding colonialism, capitalism, and gender. So uh, briefly, I'll discuss the, the methodological conundrums that actually allow us to, 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 to have interesting and stimulating conversation. The first one, and I'll, I'll zoom back to the map, the first methodological issue I, I wish to discuss concerns issues around commemorating war. If you, if you go to the map and you browse data, for instance, I'm gonna hide all the others. Uh, the most frequent uh, or the most popular monument in Puerto Rico are monuments to war veterans, the fallen in, in combat. So this is the island, right? It's an archipelago. Um, but in this case, these monuments are all on the, on the big island. And um, many men and women in Puerto Rico were deployed in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and continue to serve under the Stars and Stripes to this day. Identifying these monuments as commemorations of US imperialism felt a bit too simplistic. Firstly, it considers those fallen in combat as mere victims, which reduces their deaths as collateral damage from imperialism. Many of these men and women uh, willfully chose to serve, some perhaps for altruistic reasons. Thus, their recognition, while representative of Puerto Rico's lack of sovereignty and prolonged colonial status, should not be used as a way of highlighting this issue. It could instead point to a different issue, most notably the perpetuity of war and violence, of bellicose interventions in the name of capitalism and not just imperialism. Capitalism is the biggest cog in the modern colonial paradigm, but how do we map it? We can't. We can simply reveal the ways it manifests itself, much like coloniality, through different means. Thus, monuments to Puerto Rican veterans, soldiers, and those fallen in the name of Uncle Sam, those clearly, though clearly indicative of US imperialism, speak more, I would argue, to the role of capitalism in the modern colonial world. Second, it has been difficult to decide whether and how to map local Puerto Rican elites. Puerto Rico is a non-sovereign territory whose political arena has been dominated by two parties, one that promotes assimilation into the United States and another that defends the Commonwealth status. 
It could easily be argued that both sponsor colonial formulas that reproduce subjugation. With that in mind, statues to these spokesmen, and I'll show, for instance, here, Luis, Mus Luis Muñoz Marín is, was Puerto Rico's first elected governor and architect of the Commonwealth Project, an extraordinarily, extraordinarily complex historical figure. Uh, we can see him as an agent of colonialism for promoting the Commonwealth status. But at the same time, that, uh, that would sort of push us away from a deeper conversation of coloniality as gender, racial, uh, and, and class uh, analysis that I'm trying to sort of gear. The same goes for uh, Luis Aferre, who was Puerto Rico's first pro-statehood governor. And um, anthropologist Ricardo Alegria, who, there's two statues of him here, known throughout the archipelago as the father of the of mestizaje of racial mixture racial democracy in puerto rico is considered by many to have promoted a depoliticized form of puerto rican identity that erases blackness that infantilizes blackness that folklorizes blackness right but at the same time um many celebrate him for actually promoting Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican identity as mixture instead of just pure whiteness and Eurocentrism. Um, if I proceed to map all of these individuals in light of their sponsorship of colonial formulas and racial tropes, then the map would be saturated by the polarized debates that have hampered Puerto Rican decolonization for over a century. Visualizing pro-Commonwealth and pro-statehood officials along with the intellectual architects who formulated their nation building projects would dilute the map and deviate it away from its deep colonial purpose. Finally, and the most salient issue that I have faced is gender and how do I depict and how do I map gender um, in this map. So going back to the map and specifically monuments to race and mestizaje, which I'm going to highlight here. Um, it's clear that the field is dominated by primarily depiction of white wealthy men, right? Our categories of analysis do not allow for the segregation of data related to the depiction of women. Our, um, excuse me, more specifically, monuments to mestizaje, which in Puerto Rico imply an indigenous, a black person, and a white person, and their harmonious mixture is sort of what, what constitutes Puerto Rican identity. For instance, and we go to San Juan, I'm gonna zoom in here. If we go to old San Juan, the colonial city, and we go to this monument right here. So um, this monument is called La Plaza de la Herencia, the, the Plaza of the Inheritance of the Americas. And there's a very interesting statue here, well, a bunch of them, but specifically this one. This one is dedicated to racial mixture. It shows Juan Ponce de Leon, conqueror of the island with a Taina indigenous woman who is only referred to as Aguaybana's sister and the black child who clutches at Ponce de Leon's hip. The fact that the artist chose this specific and well-known Taina indigenous woman, what her name is Guanina, and left her nameless is quite revealing. According to 16th century chroniclers, Guanina married Cristobal de Sotomayor, a Spanish colonist. Got that. Thank you, uh, Mert. Um, and she, the, the, the popular folkloric myth is that when she died, she died after the, during the rebellion, when the Tainos rebels against Spain, she refused to leave Cristobal de Sotomayor's side. She clutched at him as he was fallen in battle. And the myth is that as she died, their blood combined and formed the beautiful tree, right? Kids learn this myth about union and harmony, um, about indigenous peoples and the Spanish, and rarely are they confronted or, or are they, or is the conversation about the rape, the pillage, the violence, the, the unequal relationship and status between these groups. So how do I map these? Do I choose to create a new category of gender specifically? Do I create a new map all around just issues around gender? In this case, I chose to map them as, as part of mestizaje and racial mixture. Thus, um, these are some of sort of the, the, the issues I've been facing, uh, methodological issues in, in digital mapping that, as I've shown, 
allow us to have some interesting conversations around intersectionality. Uh, the process of doing digital humanities stimulates intellectual growth and creates opportunities of inquiry and problem solving that speak to the complicated world we live in today. So thank you very much uh, for your time, everyone.